Yes, this is a very exciting piece of research. And we're, we're well aware that we need to collect information on whether we can mix vaccine schedules. Although it's our advice to have the same second vaccine as, as the first vaccine at the moment, um, there is promising uh, experimental evidence that actually the uh, mixing of vaccines actually might give you a better and a longer term of term protection. And so we're very, very interested in the results of this study. And of course, um, going along the line, we're going to have many, many more vaccines and many, many more potential combinations of vaccines. So it's going to be really important that we see this data when it comes out and make some policy decisions about who is going to receive which vaccines. There are also potential supply benefits, aren't there, if you've got the 12-week gap and somebody has had a Pfizer vaccine, for example, you've got to be able to guarantee you've got enough stocks of that ready to give the second dose at this point. If you can mix, depending on what you've got the most of at that time, that would be an advantage, wouldn't it? Probably a huge advantage, yes. I mean, our advice at the moment is that it's much better to have a second dose of a different vaccine than no vac second dose at all. But that is not based on any evidence other than theoretical evidence, which we know from other vaccines, such as hepatitis B, Ebola vaccines, that you can actually mix vaccine schedules. But, but actually getting some hard scientific data on this will be really important. In, in guiding our policy decision making in the future. But are you confident that without getting that data at this stage, based on what we know so far, we will have the right doses to be able to give people the second dose of the vaccine they've already had? Well, it's our preferred uh, steer on JCBI that you do have that sec same second dose of vaccine as you had the first. Um, so uh, these are all down to supply issues, really, which is outside the JCVI's remit. But at the moment, our clear steer is to have the same second doses first. Um, but we do understand in, in exceptional circumstances where this isn't possible, our guidance is still that it's better to have a second dose, another vaccine than no vaccine at all. At the moment, the focus is on delivering first doses. As we head towards at the end of March, beginning of April, we'll start to see uh, that 12-week window opening up for the second doses for uh, the first cohorts. What is the impact of those second doses going to have on the rate of delivery of vaccines, the number of people, new people we're seeing being vaccinated? Well, clearly our priority is to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. And one, of the, one of the things that the government have been very good at, I think, is increasing the capacity of vaccinators. So with mass vaccination sites, with hospital hubs, with a fantastic primary care network, which we've got throughout the country, we're really up to the challenge of vaccinating both first and second doses. And, and you know, this is going to be incredibly important. I mean, I think actually... I believe that the rate limiting factor is going to be supply rather than vaccinators because I think the capacity for vaccination is, is very large in this country and very impressive. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're a GP uh, as well. You've also been involved in vaccinating people. And from your experience doing that, at the moment, it does seem, does it not, that the, the limiting factor is the supply of vaccines. Uh, the health care workers, the frontline workers are there ready to vaccinate if they're given the supply? No, you're absolutely right. In our own practice, we have the uh, capacity to deliver more than 1,000 vaccines per week, uh, and we're not getting that amount of supply at the moment. So because we've done so well, it's rightly been the supply, which is limited, is rightly been devolved to parts of the country and areas that have, have had less success in uh, vaccinating a percentage of their, their vulnerable population. So I fully appreciate that. So, so Hence my, my strong view that it's not vaccinating capacity that's the issue, it's supply. But of course, it's difficult. I mean, these, these, these uh, vaccines are very difficult to manufacture. They have to go through all sorts of quality control. The distribution chain is difficult. It involves a, a very clear cold chain, particularly for the Pfizer vaccine, which has to be delivered at, at, at very, very low temperatures, minus 70. So, so this isn't easy, but we're doing incredibly well in our country. We, we, you know, to receive to bypass the, the the ten million mark is is an extraordinary achievement, a national achievement, and and I have every confidence that we're going to press on ahead 
and, and continue with this uh, excellent results that we're getting at the moment. But if we do run into supply issues with, for example, Pfizer, you would advocate for people getting an AstraZeneca vaccine rather than nothing at all. So we could see a situation where we have mixed doses before the findings of this trial. I mean, it's certainly possible, but I think I think everybody's making a huge effort to try and get those second doses exactly the same as the first doses. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to uh, try and marry this up. It may not be perfect, but, but it will be try. We will try our best to make sure that people receive the same vaccine type for the second dose as they have done for the first dose. The government confident we are on schedule to have administered vaccines to the first four priority groups by mid-February, then move on to groups five to nine. At what point do you envisage all over 50s having been vaccinated and then uh, the rest of the adult population? Some reports all adults could be fully vaccinated by August. Is that realistic? Well, I, I, I think we're, we're doing so well. The, these... Um months and uh, targets that are are, are, are mooted uh, are quite possible but I, I wouldn't like to put any predictions on the exact dates by which we'll do this all i can do is reassure the public that we will do this as quickly as and efficiently and as safely as possible uh, and and rest assured that jcr are absolutely committed at the moment to our first nine priority groups so once we've reached the uh, we've gone through the first four priority groups we still want to go through those next five priority groups from the age of 50 onwards, because I understand that there are many, many people uh, in 50 to 70 year old age group that are very sick in hospital at the moment uh, and on ITU facilities. So we don't, don't want to lose sight of the fact that this illness is particularly attacks people, older people uh, and age is a huge risk factor. And, and just because we've got down to the 70 age group, we should be pushing ahead to try and get all those vaccinated from 50 and above. So then no plans at this stage to start vaccinating teachers when we move into the next groups, five to nine? And of course, all teachers that, that fit into the age group of 50 and above or have an underlying illness will be vaccinated. Um, after that, phase two is going to be partly a decision about uh, clinical need, uh, but partly a political decision about which groups, um, key workers and such are, are going to be vaccinated. So, so there's going to be a number of different elements to phase two. But from JCVI, we're still very clear that we, we understand about um, those that are risk of disease, those that are deprived populations, those ethnic minority groups that we need to reach out to. Uh, and we will be pushing that very hard. Whether we go along the key worker approach depends on input from uh, our bodies other than ours. Um, what do you make of the suggestion that we had the ONS figures this week, one in seven people had had the virus by mid-January, some suggestion that those who've had a previous infection of coronavirus and have antibodies could be just given one dose of the vaccine? Is that something that the JCVI would back? Well, uh, theoretically, that, that, that's not a bad idea. But of course, practically, it's quite a difficult thing to do because you would have to demonstrate that the person had antibodies uh, before they uh, got the vaccine, which could then act as a booster dose uh, following their natural infection. So practically, this might be quite difficult to do. Theoretically, it's not a silly idea, but it's one that we will discuss on JCVI in detail and, and, and formulate some clear uh, policy advice around. Just one very brief final thought. We've had a little bit more information from AstraZeneca uh, this week. Are you still comfortable with that 12-week gap between doses? Well, the AstraZeneca data looks really uh, fabulous, actually. I mean, it, it does seem to suggest that not only does the first dose give you substantial protection, but a delay in the second dose to 12 weeks gives you a better and longer term protection. So, so this, this was all very positive evidence um, to, uh, to acknowledge that our strategy that we've boldly outlined is probably the correct strategy, not only for the population, but might be the correct strategy for that individual in terms of getting longer and better term protection. The other exciting thing about the AstraZeneca data was the 
the, um, the data which suggests that uh, two thirds of um, people that have had the vaccine don't transmit. And that's going to be hugely important in trying to contain the epidemic that we're in. Professor Anthony Harnden, thank you very much indeed.